Hey, folks, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. We've got a long list of people who perform here today. Uh, and the, uh, one of the reasons we do this is because we don't have many opportunities to see each other and hear each other. But uh, so we're, we're here. We're glad to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you come, oh, there you go. When you uh, when you come up and, and read, as most, some of you know, they have to say, "Eat the mic," and that is true. I can tell. So, uh, and, and if you're going to visit, I understand why well, you might like to, but do that in the outside there, uh, if you would, please. You have a little conversation. You want to keep keep going somehow. Just wander on out there like you're going to have a smoke. You know, you wouldn't smoke in here, so you won't visit in here either, and that that'll be fine. You know, we've got 30. Uh, 33 or so people, and we'd like to get out of here in a couple of hours, and uh, if pe 33 people take three minutes apiece, that gives us just enough time to make the transitions and things. And uh, I, you know, I could tell you how long three minutes is going to be, just if you need a, tar a target. We've been better and better. It's taken us 22 tries to uh, understand what the limits are, but uh, uh, we all appreciate uh, uh, those who are able to get up and give us a quick something and, and get on and make room for somebody else, you know. So we've all enjoyed 15-minute sp uh, spots over the weekend and long leisurely conversations. This is not really the place for that because we want to hear from at least 33, and I'm sure there'll be others who want to sign up and then get out of here by noon or so. So we, we could stay till 4, I'm sure, if we if we went at the pace uh, that we kind of would like to. Um, I think I have a couple of announcements, and one of the most important ones is Pat Dixon is uh, every year taking a, a group photo of those who linger and hang on, and some folks that I believe already today, but uh, if you uh, are still with us uh, immediately after this, uh, uh, this farewell, then uh, Pat, where would you like people to meet? I think we'll go outside where there's, where there's more light, so maybe, uh, maybe out the front. Out in yeah, 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 we'll, we'll let readers, yeah, readers only. Talking. Yeah. Why don't we all? Why don't we all congregate out? Uh, just, uh, I don't, yeah, hey, I would think. Here, think okay, here's yeah. Okay, Pat will think about it. having been a school teacher himself, and me having been a school teacher. We understand a lot of things can go wrong trying to move a group of people from one place to another. <laughs> yeah, I think the shortest distance between the it would be. Yeah, so right out yeah okay. okay, okay. So we'll be doing that afterwards, and so don't die. We can take care of that quickly. Uh, the gear shack is locked up. You know, I could have made it more uh, uh, mm, uh, clear that, that it's not open today. But it is. Uh, when this is over, I'll go over there and open it up, and uh, uh, and and y'all can pick up the stuff that you've left. And uh, I don't think my wife Doreen is going to come down. Uh, you know, I uh, I just am so grateful for her help. She is the gr grease in your gears. Yeah. I'll, I should, I should dial her up right now and just, uh, do you want to try that? She may still be asleep, but she doesn't sleep that much. Watch this. I'm taking, this is way longer than three minutes. Let's, let's see if this works. No, just give her a cheer. Uh, phone number, four and five. Three, three. The speed dial doesn't work for me. <laughs> now, knowing Doreen, she's, she gets up every week at 4.30 to drive down to Tillamook to teach second graders. And gets home about 7 o'clock. You can't imagine, I mean, it's embarrassing how hard she works. Hi, love. Say, um, I have some people who'd like to say thank you. Just, uh... Okay, she says she loves you all and she's, she's recovering. Thank you. Okay, see ya. Oh, you know, and some of us say we don't like technology. Oh, well, thanks so much. That really, that, that, you just saved my ass. So, uh, you know, we, the limit, we were talking three minutes, and three minutes goes by pretty fast. And so we came up, so it wasn't me, somebody had a great idea, maybe it was Rich King. Uh, at three minutes, or three minutes and five seconds, I'm going to start to clap. And that means your time is, is over. And I would like everybody else to clap with me. And don't leave me 
alone. Because it really is, a, uh, as an MC, the, my, the greatest fear for me is to have to pull somebody who's doing something great and enthusiastic, and even the crowd is into it, but time is up, and we gotta, we got to get out of the water. You know, most of us who are commercial fishermen know that. So, <laughs> we're going to be fine. Our, our first person is uh, Bruce Jones, mayor of the uh, city of Astoria. Morning. I have to take off my uh, Fisher Poet participant hat real quick, put on my mayor hat. I just want to thank John and Jay and all the volunteers and the board members and all of the participants um, for this wonderful festival that you put on. The city of Astoria appreciates it so very much. And as we, uh, as we fight hard to retain our unique uh, heritage as a, as a fishing and a historic town and not become uh, another coastal tourist town, this is such a key part of that. So thank all of you. How about a round of applause for the whole team? I, I started flying Coast Guard helicopter search and rescue about 35 years ago. And at that time, if we were looking for you at night, you didn't have flares and lights, or if your boat had sunk and you were treading water, man, you were out of luck. And then came along night vision goggles. They changed everything, saved a lot of lives. So I think a, a poem about night vision goggles is uh, the most romantic thing you could have. <laughs> on, a, on a moonless, cloudless night, far from land and warm bed, the star-filled sky stretches limitless through the plexiglass overhead. But seen through night vision goggles, which turn a thousand stars to a million and reveal a secret world invisible to the naked eye of shooting stars and satellites. And even on rare nights, shimmering northern lights, a whale spout just once, gulls and turns in abundance, pot floats pelicans by the hundreds, appearing clear as day, resting on the pitch black ocean 500 feet below. It's always jaw-dropping, and I relish the otherworldly scenes as we journey through solitary skies over lonely seas, sights unimagined by those outside our small society. Miracle optics that amaze me still, originally designed to find and kill unsuspecting foes on the battlefield, now in our hands instead reveal your wake, your rigging, your boots and clothes. Keep me from flying into the ocean at 2 a.m., hoisting a dewatering pump to your leaking, listing trawler. Or, if we arrive too late, give us hope to find you floating in the briny blue. If there's a bit of moon or even just starlight, then every bit of debris floating on the sea is visible through green-tinted lens. And you, for whom we will search through the night and long hours as if you were our own family, will do all in our powers to bring you home to yours. Thank you. Schoonmaker, Erica, Jeff, Lori, Mark, uh, uh, Abigail, Ed, Nancy Cook, Rob, and then Doreen. That's 10. Thank you, Astoria. I love coming down here 12 times now. This one's called Stay. Opens a sky of pink and gray blue. Glitters of frost that last week was due. Showered in leaves as breezes come through. So ends the summer. What's grown is what grew. My boat's on a trailer, my net's in a bag. I made it back safely, not much to brag. I've seen better summers and I know I've seen worse. I'm kind of a winner, it's just there's no purse. I picked out a fair jag and I made some nice sets. Not much for mama, but paid up some debts. Some people see trouble with fishing today. When talking with me, they ask why I stay. We call it our lifestyle, that's why we stay. And that's why we borrow and hope we can pay. You know, it's gotten a lot tougher, but then so have I. With lower expectations, I just live on this pie. But there's still nothing like it. My hand on the wheel. I'm not leased by a boss. I don't have to heal. I'm out in the scenes on some beautiful bay. I'm paid for my troubles in more than one way. Go think like a salmon and try to go back to thinking like a goldfish. You know where I'm at. <laughs> Maybe I'll stay broke. What can I say? At least I'm not broken. That's why I stay. That's a tough act to follow Steve every time. Ugh. I'm Erica. I moved to Astoria from Cordova uh, just this summer. And uh, I was born and raised in Kodiak. And 
This is a poem about my experience with the Exxon Valdez oil spill. I sat under the stairs all day for weeks. In 1989, my mom worked as an expediter with another fisherman's wife out of a home office on the side of Pillar Mountain overlooking my hometown of Kodiak, Alaska. You could see the harbors and you could see the canneries and you could feel the doom. I was four years old, almost five and I sat under the stairs day in and day out after my morning preschool. Sometimes I got picked up for play dates, but most of the time I played under the stairs. The house we were at, a family friend's, was home to a teenage girl and a little brother. The little brother wasn't very friendly, he didn't share his toys, and he had a reputation for being a bit of a spoiled brat. About six years later, that same little boy and that same teenage girl lost their father when their boat sank and all hands were lost at sea. But that April, I sat under the stairs and I brought my bag of toys and I listened to my mom rattle off lists of groceries and boom and hoses and tubing and didn't know what it all meant. All I knew was that it was important and it kept her so busy and it meant we couldn't go to the beach, we couldn't go play at Fort Abercrombie, we weren't going out to lunch, and we weren't spending casual afternoons drawing or painting or planting seedlings. No, that April I sat under the stairs and I listened. And I listened to my mother and I listened to this other mom talk about what this would do for our futures to our fisheries and what the long-term decimation of a fishery might look like. So hopeful that maybe, just maybe, it wouldn't touch our shores, wouldn't coat our beaches like it had Prince William Sound, that it would miss us, that it wouldn't coat the water's surface like the black tar that it did over there smothering a season's run of herring row, a fishing industry that they had both partaken in many years ago before becoming mothers and wives and expediters in this moment. I sat under the stairs and I listened. As a young woman, I went back to school for a master's degree and I got one in education and counseling. And I wrote my thesis on how the psychosocial impacts of human-caused technological disasters affect the social and emotional and mental health of adolescent youth. Because like me, there were so many of my generation and about half a dozen years older that sat under the stairs or around the kitchen tables and watched their parents as the devastation of our fisheries was foreshadowed in the darkness of the oil as it rolled up on our beaches. Many of our families would never recover. Many families would suffer from depression, alcoholism, and other forms of substance abuse to cope with the loss of a livelihood, the loss of an industry, the loss of a lifestyle. My entire generation would be told to go to college, get a degree, don't rely on fishing. And many of us would. Many of us would leave fishing and because our predecessors told us that it was not something to depend on anymore and because we had witnessed the fallout of a cataclysmic event in fisheries history and it would take us years to return home to those waters. I sat under the stairs and I listened. When I started fishing, there weren't nearly as many ladies, women. The other half of our species was not included in the fisheries very often, but there were some, and this one's to them. And this one's called One of the Guys. Okay. She didn't look like much striding down the dock pugnacious as a bulldog with her jaw thrust out and her rolling walk. Couldn't have weighed a hundred pounds with her dirty car hearts thrown in. <laughs> but she came well recommended from the same boat where she'd been. The halibut derby, a day away, we're baiting at full speed. Well, okay, we'll, we'll give you a try. You can't cost much to feed. <laughs> she pitched in tying ganyans, a whiz at sharpening hook. But when lunchtime came, she set us straight. <laughs> I may be a girl, but I don't cook. When we started pulling back the gear, bucking a nasty chop, she was sure-footed, quick on the deck like a Texas League shortstop, gutting the butts, pulling the nuts, 
even on a big barn door. Never a wasted motion, like she'd done all this before. And when we landed a big lively one, arching and thumping and kicking, she'd attack with the back of the gaff like a blood-crazed berserk Viking. <laughs> Till he lay there, stunned and quivering, twice as big as her. Then her knife went in, and the gut spilled out, and she looked around for more. When we had him iced down in the hold, and we're running back to town, she stood a five-hour wheel watch so us guys could all lie down. <laughs> Up at the bar, it drinks all around from another long line crew when one of their deck apes smirks and says, you took a girl with you? She didn't say a word, just flipped him the bird. <laughs> Went on with her drinking. I stood us all another round, and then I got to thinking. I said, you pulled more than your weight out there in the sound. But if you really want to be one of the guys, you'll need to buy a round. 